Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, <clears throat> so, or a couple of minutes after the hour. So this is the second of our uh, health disparities and equity research program set of presentations. Um, today, we have another couple of our pilot awardees who will be sharing the work that they've done um, with support from the pilot program. Again, these were one-year awards that largely took place during 2022 uh, with funds from, um, for support from the Regan Street Institute. And I think you'll be impressed with how much they've accomplished. Um, I'd like to thank again, um, Brian Dixon, my co-leader, and Holly Martin, our program manager, who uh, um, helped make this all possible. <clears throat> I also want to make a couple of announcements. One is that one of our um, grantees was not able to present today, um, Arthur Awara. Uh, his project was entitled Quantifying and Reducing Bias in the Prediction of Pediatric Asthma Using Electronic Health Records, a Retrospective Cohort Study. And he worked on that together with, with Juan Zhu Tu and Col Colin, um, Colin Rogerson. So I think uh, that has led to some good things. Uh, Dr. Awara now has uh, received a career development award and is uh, continuing to progress along this line of work. The other announcement that I wanted to make, and I think um, more will be shared or has been shared, but we have uh, two new pilots that we'll be funding in the upcoming cycle. One of those is led, being led by Dr. Rebecca Rivera and is entitled Food Treatment, Addressing Food Security and Cancer Care. And the second is led by Dr. Vest, and he will um, pursue a, a project, an expert panel development and feasibility of a, um, expert panel development and feasibility of a polysocial risk score. So those are again, um, both being supported by the Regan Street Institute's um, Health Disparities and Equity Research Program and then uh, Dr. Rivera's project is also uh, receiving some matching funds from HEAL R, uh, which is an acronym that stands for Health Equity Advancing, Advancing Through Learning Health Systems Research, and that's led by Dr. Bronson Tucker Edmonds. So now to the uh, the uh, main part of the presentation here today, I will introduce our, our first presenter, uh, Dr. Marianne Mathias. Um, Dr. Mathias is a research professor in the IU School of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine Geriatrics. She's also a core investigator at the VA HSRD COIN or Center for Health Information and Communication. And finally, a scientist in our Center for Health Services Research. Um, so actually, um, I might need to switch the presentations around a little bit. Is that okay? Okay. Well, actually, uh, we're queued up differently, so I'm just going to uh, introduce both presenters at the outset here. So um, our presenter to start off with, then followed by Dr. Matthias, will be uh, Dr. Joanna Lyson. Uh, Dr. Lyson's assistant research professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics. She is also a core investigator in the VA HSRD COIN and also a scientist in our Center for Health Services Research. So thank you, Joanne. Good afternoon. I was going to say good morning. It's afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I would like to start by taking Dr. Hamstrom, uh, the Health Equity Research Committee and the Wigan Street Institute for supporting this work and making it possible. And it was a really fun project, and I'm very fortunate that I was able to carry it out. Um, I also would like to acknowledge our team and collaborators. Uh, I was very fortunate to work with some wonderful um, staff members and researchers across the Institute and um, in IU. I also would like to acknowledge our partners. Oh, this is better? Uh, great. Hi. Hopefully that does the trick, thank you. Um, Eskenazi Health was the primary site uh, for this project. We also received some support from the IUDP research team 
And we were really fortunate to work with several individuals from diverse neighborhoods in Indianapolis who collaborated with us on this project and they actively participated throughout the different phases of the study. And this was a community engaged research project and um, I am very thankful for their collaboration. The focus of this project is social isolation. Social isolation is an objective state characterized by limited or lack of social engagement. Uh, it is an adverse social determinant of health and it is quite prevalent in the US. About one in five adults report experiences of social isolation. You probably have become more aware of social isolation because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but there has been a lot of work um, in, this, uh, in this space focusing on social isolation. This is not my slide, it's borrowed from uh, the Office of the US Surgeon General, uh, and it is adapted from a paper that was recently published. And as you can see on this slide, it depicts rates of social connection and social isolation in terms of how many hours we spend engaging with others in person outside of one's household. And uh, you can see that there's a downward trend of social connection. So even before the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we are spending less time engaging with others on a regular basis. So why is this important? Um, there has been a lot of research, again, on social isolation. It is well documented and we have robust evidence demonstrating that social connection is essential for well-being and the absence of that social isolation, for instance, is detrimental. Social isolation is a significant contributor to both morbidity and early mortality. We have um, evidence demonstrating that social isolation causes heart disease and a number of other chronic physical health conditions. It contributes to common mental health disorders such as anxiety and depression. It has been linked to cognitive decline and suicidality. Social isolation is also very costly. In the US, it costs over $2 billion every year in extra healthcare expenditures. There has been recently a lot of calls uh, from um, international organizations and nationally about social isolation. And uh, more recently, about two weeks ago, the US Surgeon General released his first advisory report on social connection, which they identified as one of the six priority areas. And uh, the office um, joined uh, other organizations identifying social isolation as a global public health threat. And they demand for um, more social, poor social connection policies, greater awareness about social isolation, um, and as well as health systems to do more. They demand health systems to be more proactive, to uh, develop interventions that are implementable in clinical settings to improve population health and improve our social connections. So as a first step in our effort to respond to this call, we develop uh, this study, this pilot study, um, last year, maybe a little bit more than last year. So we had two aims. Um, the first aim was to identify and characterize a cohort of Eskenazi health patients at risk for social isolation. I should emphasize that we were very intentional in our health equity approach to this study. Most studies on social isolation focus on older populations and rightly so, uh, but they also, um, have primarily white female participants. A systematic review showed that about 89% of research studies on social isolations are white older female research, uh, research participants. So we really wanted to explore what social isolation looks like in a diverse sample. Um, and we leverage our relationship, uh, Regan Swift's relationship with Eskenazi Health to um, to look at a, a subsample of uh, patients um, in this health system. Our second aim was to uh, develop a framework for a social isolation intervention. And we use multiple research methods, including community-based participatory research, um, intervention mapping, and the WE-AIM implementation framework. Uh, for the first aim, we were fortunate to collaborate with Dr. Vess, who had an ongoing R1 where he was already assessing uh, for social determinants of health. Uh, he was surveying 
um, patients, adult patients receiving care at Eskenazi Health Emergency Departments. And we use um, 504 surveys that were completed. And uh, those surveys were completed from August 2021 to May 2022. And we link those uh, completed surveys to um, patients' records in INPC. And we had two goals. The first was to characterize a cohort of patients at risk of social isolation. And the second was to identify associations between social isolation, patient characteristics, and health outcomes. And the measure that were used to identify um, social isolation was the SNI, which is a well, uh, frequently used, validated measure. Um, so without giving too many details, here are some key takeaways uh, from uh, the first aim. Of the 504 patients surveyed, about 32% were identified as severely isolated and 39% were moderately isolated. This number seems very high. Um, and partly we believe that it's because we surveyed patients from the ED and ED patients um, often have um, high social risk and high health-related unmet social needs. So this may be part of it. Uh, but this is also consistent from emerging studies showing that there are high reports or high rates of social isolation. We didn't find any sex or age associations in this sample. However, we did see that younger adults, those under the age of 55, had higher rates of social isolation. Uh, and those in the age bracket of 18 to 24 had even higher rates of reports of social isolation. This is consistent with what we are uh, seeing in the literature. Um, in this sample, having a, identify being Hispanic or having a commercial health insurance were protective factors. Uh, we also look at patients' uh, mental health and substance use disorders diagnosis. There was no significant relationship with having a mental health uh, diagnosis, but patients who had a substance use disorder diagnosis reported higher rates of social isolation. Um, in this study, we also looked at environmental factors by looking at patients' zip codes, looking to see if there are some neighborhood characteristics that might be linked to social isolation. The only factor that was significant was the percentage of uh, residents who didn't have a car. And we think this might be an indicator not just of SES, but perhaps of disability as well as those who may have limited mobility um, or other type of disability may not be as socially engaged. Moving on to the second aim, uh, which was the qualitative aim. Um, for this one, we conducted semi-structured interviews with three groups of participants. Uh, the first one was Eskenazi Health patients. Eskenazi Health was already rolling out their own social determinant of health screener, and it included several questions assessing social isolation. And we identified uh, patients who endorsed experiences of social isolation, and we recruited patients from that pool. We also interviewed five Eskenazi health providers that included community health workers, social workers, and uh, general practitioners in primary care. We uh, collaborated with six individuals from different neighborhoods uh, who were part of a community engagement board, and we conducted four 90 minutes focus groups with them. We also spent a lot of time talking to people. We, we talked to a lot of representatives from different community organizations who are interested in topics such as social connection and well-being. Uh, we started our interviews with participants uh, with one question asking them, what does social isolation mean to you? And we used the term so often that we kind of took it for granted. Everybody knew what we were talking about. And this was a really useful exercise because the participants basically gave us a blank <laughs> stare and they had no idea what we were saying. Um, but once we described to them what we were, um, uh, what the topic of the study is, what we kind of like give them a few cues of what we were talking about, they understood the term, but they were just not familiar with social isolation per se. And it was really helpful because they gave us some great advice. Uh, we learned that they view the term social isolation as highly stigmatizing, and they recommended that we do not use it, especially in future recruitment materials. 
Um, and they also provided some nuanced descriptions of what it means to them uh, to be socially isolated. And we included a few on this slide here. Um, again, as a reminder, the interviews were conducted with patients who um, already endorsed experiences of social isolation. And we asked them whether they had discussed their experiences during he their healthcare visits with a primary care provider. And all of them said no, but those who had a mental health care provider said yes, they did bring it up. Um, about half, the, half of them, they brought it up to their mental health provider or their therapist. However, they reported mixed results. Uh, some of them said their therapists were great and provided support, and others said that therapists had no idea what they were talking about and basically suggested they just need to get out more, but they didn't provide any kind of like specific um, advice on how they can be more socially engaged. Participants also shared that they didn't see social isolation as being an important enough subject to bring up to their medical provider. And they also didn't see the medical provider having uh, the expertise to really help them. They didn't see it as being part of their scope of practice or going to the healthcare system uh, for social um, isolation related concerns. However, they all reported social isolation as being an important um, topic to be intervened on. Um, and they view it that is an important concern for their community. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we talked to about uh, five providers um, and I will just highlight a few themes from their interviews and they were pretty consistent. Uh, most providers uh, share that they don't have one way to screen or to identify patients who are isolated. They basically just read between the lines if a patient brings it up. Um, all of their narratives focus on older adults. Their image of somebody who's isolated is the image I had earlier on. It's somebody who's a senior, who was frail, who has low SES and living alone, uh, which is inconsistent with what we know about social isolation being an experience that um, many people have across the life, over the life course. Many also reported that they didn't know how to help. They also identify telehealth as being very challenging. Uh, they discussed that it's really hard to comfort someone and be supportive when you're providing services via telehealth modality. They talk about community resources. They shared that, well, we could refer somebody to a community agency, but those are quite limited. But also the referral system is quite inconsistent. Um, it's really hard to know if the patient has used services or if it was helpful, there's no way to kind of like close the loop. So they identify a lot of opportunities to improve the system. Um, very briefly, we had a lot of discussions with participants about what um, effective, potentially effective, um, acceptable um, and implementable intervention could look like. Um, and they had a lot to say. Uh, we uh, basically summarized the discussions into two broad categories. We um, have the first one, the behavioral determinants. These are behavioral factors that they see driving social isolation and their suggestions for how to address them. Uh, for the participants, the patients, it was really um, uh, important to include peer support in whatever intervention we develop. They thought that it should be uh, an essential component. They also talk a lot about skill building. They emphasize that they would like an intervention to not just connect them to new people to make new connections, but they also want to learn how to maintain those connections. They also um, spent a lot of time linking social isolation to overall well-being, and noted that they should uh, the intervention also needs to incorporate mental health services. On the other hand, looking at environmental factors, uh, we had a lot of discussion talking about how challenging it is for many of our participants to uh, participate in the social life of their community because of violence and because of neighborhood characteristics. And they talk about how it will be helpful to have navigation to resources, but also to figure out how they can engage with others, have relationships, be socially engaged while navigating violence in their community and also poverty. Uh, they talk about a lot of barriers that keep them from being socially connected and engaged and, and trusting others. And they noted that having opportunities um, that where they could um, participate in social activities without worrying about costs will be helpful.
So this is the framework we ended up with. Uh, this has gone through multiple iterations, um, and it was developed in collaboration with patients, uh, or community board mem uh, engagement board members, and Eskenazi leaders. We had several meetings with uh, the social determinant of health um, committee leaders from Eskenazi Health to talk about what um, um, intervention could look like, how it could be integrated in their existing system and, and workflow. So just very briefly, I'll just highlight a few things from this for you. <clears throat> so they decided that the intervention should focus on adults who screen positive for social isolation. It should be um, housed at a, in a primary care clinic, but in one of the health equity zones. And it should integrate both the health system and community organizations. It should be a, a team-based type of intervention that will include community health workers, community weavers, and um, LSW, but anyone who's a licensed, mental, uh, licensed professional with mental health expertise. And they also had ideas about the time frame. They really wanted it to be kind of like a circular type of system where we start with individual sessions with the patients, uh, but also provide more kind of like comprehensive skill building, um, social support, um, and social contacts uh, to the participants. But at the end of the intervention, the participants should be handed off to a community organizations where they can continue to be socially engaged uh, after their participation in the intervention. This is a living document, so we keep getting feedback from uh, our different community partners about how to make this framework work. Um, so our next step, we're still having conversations with um, our community partners and we are looking for funding. Uh, hopefully we can secure some funding to develop the intervention and pilot test it. And on that note, thank you so much for um, your attention. <laughs> I think we have a few minutes for questions. Folks. When you're initially serving folks, um, you medical providers didn't think that they had the expertise or that it really fit within their sort of domain of practice. And I noticed the patients also said that. I think that's interesting that sort of both sides, the patients and providers, are saying this doesn't quite fit into the medical institution. This, our sense of this problem, we do have a sense of the problem, but it just doesn't fit into um, this institution here. Well, um, I will qualify that a little bit. I think the providers talk more about self-efficacy in addressing the problem and not saying that it doesn't fit their institutions. They definitely see social isolation as being important to be addressed within the health, health system. Whether it is them personally, there's a question mark. Um, I think that many of them um, would like to, but there are a lot of constraints and they see it as important for well-being. So um, talking about social isolation is part of health. Um, so it's still within kind of like the jurisdiction, but how do we make it work? I think that's where the challenge is. <coughs> Brian? <coughs> Sorry, allergies. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Uh, so I had a question about the screening process. So you mentioned that what triggers this is a positive screen on the screener that Eskenazi has been rolling out. So um, one is, uh, you know, well, my main question is, will those screening data be captured in a structured way in the electronic health record so that we can link it to, I, I assume, if as you evaluate this this intervention that you're going to do, you would want those data to to show who screened positive and then who 
who was referred out and who got treatment and then what were their outcomes, right? So is that part of the discussion that's happening with Eskenazi? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Um, I think right now they are screening, they're making revisions in their screening process and trying to identify uh, what is the best screener and how to do it succinctly. Um, but also, what do we do about it? It's like, if you're screening with people, there's the, uh, uh, it's kind of like implied that you will provide services to address that concern, but we are still developing uh, a system to figure out, well, how do we support patients who screen positive and how do we follow up with them to make sure that they receive, they met their needs, they receive the services that they needed. But also more importantly, I think it will be important to figure out whether addressing those um, social risk or unmet needs lead to better health outcomes. And, and I think that's the data we need and hopefully this project will contribute to this effort. Great. And then last question, uh, do you know, like I know, so you, uh, you got some support here through jo like from Josh's team and I know that he's, they have algorithms to identify unmet needs. So do you know if there's, if there's talk or if he's thinking about plans for continuing to sort of roll out an algorithm to help like the on the population side to identify those populations that are at risk and uh, and how that might play a role eventually into connecting people to interventions? Uh, I think that's a question best for Josh to answer. Uh, I, I think it's still in the works. Yeah, but thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Great. Well, well, thank you again, Dr. Elison. I mean, a very important area. I, I um, recall that the Surgeon General has um, issued some reports or pretty extensive comments about the importance of social isolation. So I think it's really important and topical work. So um, we'll transition between our presenters here now um, and Dr. Matthias uh, will be next and doesn't need a lot of further introduction, I don't think. So thank you, Marianne. All right, thanks, David. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, this project was focused on reducing racialized disparities in non-pharmacological pain treatments. So many of you already know that pain is prevalent and it's also costly. It affects up to 100 million Americans and amounts in up to 635 billion a year in things like direct medical costs and lost worker productivity. There are also disparities in the treatment of pain, and these disparities are well documented and they continue to persist despite recent efforts nationally to focus on health equity. And just as a few examples, compared to white patients, black patients experience greater pain severity, worse pain outcomes, and inadequate pain treatment including being offered fewer treatment options than white patients. There are also disparities in clinical communication. Again, compared to white patients, black patients have reported poor quality communication with clinicians, tend to receive less health information, feel less involved in treatment decision-making, and are more hesitant to share health concerns, opinions, and their own treatment preferences. These disparities have important implications for pain care because communication is a central component of pain care. Unlike many other conditions, much of the evaluation and treatment involves patients and providers actively communicating and talking about concerns and talking about symptoms. And so communication is central to that process. And in addition, a lot of pain treatment is preference sensitive, which means that there's not one treatment that's universally efficacious for everybody. Instead, a lot of what is chosen depends on what fits into patients' preferences, what fits into their values, what fits into their lifestyles, and ultimately what works for them. And not the same thing works for everybody. 
that again necessitates good communication between patients and their physicians. And then just a little bit about opioids too. Um, as you know, um, it's been a problem over the past couple of decades with opioid prescriptions increasing dramatically, resulting also in parallel increases in harms, including overdose and death. And in response to this, agencies, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, have recommended limiting opioid prescriptions. And instead, guidelines suggest multimodal approaches to pain treatments, where it might include medications, not necessarily opioid medications, along with a number of non-pharmacological pain treatments, or NPTs, <clears throat> as we call them, because it's a mouthful to say non-pharmacological pain treatments every time. So I will refer to them from here on out as NPTs. So NPTs consist of traditional approaches, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy, exercise, but also complementary and integrative health approaches, CIH approaches, things like acupuncture, yoga, and mindfulness and meditation. And really, more and more evidence is accumulating that supports the use of NPTs for pain. The guidelines now strongly recommend NPTs, including things like exercise, CBT, spinal manipulation, or in other words, chiropractic care, and yoga as first-line treatments for chronic low back pain. And there's also mounting evidence for other types of therapies, including acupuncture and mindfulness approaches. Uh, there, there is some evidence with some early small studies that acupuncture and chiropractic manipulation may lead to reduced opioid use. So this is a really promising new area, not new, but new in terms of evidence. But in spite of this increasing evidence, there are a number of barriers to NPT use. Um, there are notable gaps in interest in NPTs and actual use. Some of these are institutional level in terms of what's being offered at an institution or what's available, in other words, access. But there are also a number of patient level barriers. And this includes just believing that medications are stronger and therefore more effective. The lack of knowledge about NPT options, including what's available and how effective they are. And then related to that is just difficulty navigating the numerous options. There are so many options that it can be overwhelming for patients to figure out what to even think about, where to even start, including things like benefits and trade-offs. Um, there's also poor patient provider communication about NPT options. You figure most pain is managed in primary care. There's a lot more to talk about in a primary care appointment than pain. And so things like this, there's just often not time for it. And then there are also potentially challenges to engagement and motivation. Uh, and this is because NPTs take more time and commitment than say taking a medication. It takes more time to engage in regular walking or regular yoga than it does to take a pill. And usually you have to stick to it longer before you start to see results. So it really takes patience and commitment and it can be really difficult. And this of course then can ref uh, affect adherence to NPTs because you're like, oh, I've been doing this three weeks, I don't see any difference. And so you feel less motivated to do it. So these are just a few of the challenges with NPT use. And these barriers are then exacerbated for black patients. As I already mentioned, black patients are, tend to be offered fewer treatment options uh, in, when we're talking about chronic pain than white patients. And then these patient clinician communication barriers that I also talked about that are encountered by black patients can further exacerbate these challenges. So based on what I just said about, there, there's just a lot of considerations that need to go into thinking about an NPT and thinking about trying an NPT, and including thinking about what NPTs match more closely with a patient's values and priorities. For example, does a patient prefer doing things in a group? Do they like doing things on their own? 
Do they like going to some kind of clinician or provider for their care? Do they prefer not to? Do they prefer to do it from home? All of those preferences impact what NPT you might choose. And then some NPTs fit better with different people's lifestyle. If you work an hourly job where you work eight to five, Monday through Friday, you may not be able to go to regular chiropractor appointments or regular acupuncture appointments, but you might be able to go to an evening yoga class or you might be able to go for a walk in the evenings or go swimming at your local Y if you have access. So th these choices are very individualized and they're more complex than saying, well, if you take ibuprofen, these are the possible side effects. If you take opioids, these are the possible side effects. Th this really requires much more consideration of a person's lifestyle and values. So in summary, NPTs are safe and effective, but they are underused to manage chronic pain. In addition, there are barriers to NPT use. And these barriers are further exacerbated for black patients who suffer disproportionately from pain and its consequences and are offered fewer treatment options than white patients and who also frequently experience poorer communication with their clinicians, which negatively affects treatment decision making and therefore ultimately NPT use. So in comes our pilot study, which is what we did in this project. So this pilot study was focused on overcoming individual level barriers, the ones I just discussed, to NPT use for black patients to improve pain and related outcomes. The intervention consisted of two components. First, a decision aid. And a decision aid is a tool that's, it's an evidence-based tool that's been used in a variety of contexts. And it really is focused on helping patients compare different treatments their pros and cons and things like that side by side so they can figure out what's the best choice for them. So we have a decision aid focused on different NPTs that tend to be widely available. And this decision aid focuses on lining up patients' lifestyles, their values and their preferences with these different NPT options to kind of help them navigate through what I said can be an, offer, an often overwhelming list of, of options. And then there's a coaching component. And this in consisted of four individual sessions delivered over phone by a trained coach. And they used a motivational interviewing approach. And the decision aid was incorporated into the coaching. So basically over these sessions, the coach walked the patient through the decision aid and helped them figure out what their values were, how their, what their goals were, and how they line up with these different NPT options. And then ultimately, the coaches prepare patients to engage in shared decision making with their primary care providers about NPTs. So our pilot study aims, we were focused on feasibility and acceptability, as most pilot studies are. And so we evaluated feasibility of things like recruitment, retention, delivery of the intervention. And then we also did post-intervention qualitative interviews to evaluate acceptability. So we, we successfully recruited 21 patients and we retained most of them through all the coaching sessions and assessments. And this was a pre-test, post-test design, I don't think I mentioned. So regarding intervention acceptability, we had, um, we had qualitative interviews and we had patients say things like, the program made me look at some different things to get my bones and things moving and just trying to get going. So it works, it works for me. Another patient told us that the coach discussed alternatives, different other therapies that I could do. I had never thought about those things. And that theme came up a lot. People just saying, oh, you know, they opened up a whole new world. I'd never even considered or thought about these things. And then another person valued the encouragement. It was helpful to have the coach's encouragement because without that, I don't think I would have thought of taking my doctor's appointments back on my own. So again, this is another theme that kind of came up is the idea of taking those doctor's appointments back. Remember I said that often research shows that black patients are less, uh, more reluctant to express themselves and to assert themselves in doctor's appointments. And for this person, it felt like the, the coaching process gave them the confidence they needed to assert themselves. 
other people said, the coach gave some really good suggestions on how to be heard. What are your next steps if you're treated with disrespect? So from that perspective, I felt the study was really great. I have had issues of not being heard, not believed. And then someone else said, there's absolutely nothing I would change. And you notice a lot of the things that these participants said wasn't really about the NPT specifically, right? It was about empowerment. It was about helping people have the self-efficacy to ask for and get what they want to get out of their doctor's appointments and hopefully from there improve their pain. About the decision aid itself, people said, um, th this was met with some mixed um, reviews by the doctors specifically. One person said, reviewing the decision aid got on my doctor's nerves. I'm trying to do something positive for myself and it just kind of pissed me off a little bit. So um, it, again, it was not universally accepted by all physicians. Um, the doctor was acting all anxious, like she had to get the next patient. So she looked at it and she said, can we do this another time? And then there were some that were well received as well. I was able to sit down with my doctor and she actually listened and took account of what me and the coach talked about. So this is a good example of the need. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of talk, including publications and, and writings and health equity specifically, about the need for multi-level intervention. And so, you know, there's there's um, systemic and and um, community level racism, and then there's um, there's things that happen on an interpersonal individual level, which is largely what I've been talking about today. And really, we need intervention at all levels to really make a change. So um, this is one component in what will hopefully be ultimately a, a multi-component approach toward helping to achieve health equity in chronic pain care, not just specific to NPTs, but in this case, that's what we're focused on here. So our next steps, we actually have NIH funding that started in the fall um, for a study called Equity Using Interventions for Pain and Depression, or EQUIPED. Um, depression was not an inclusion criterion for the study I just told you about, but um, there's a high, high comorbidity between the two. So it wasn't a stretch to add depression. And the particular RFA that we got funded on was focused on equity and pain and comorbidities. So depression was the, a logical comorbidity to focus on. And this is a five year, um, that's actually a typo, it's an R61, R33. Um, in case you're wondering what an R63 was, I don't know if it exists. Um, but if it does, I don't have one. Um, so the, the first phase is a planning phase. And that's what we're in right now where we did some, uh, we established a patient panel uh, where we, we found actual Eskenazi patients, including a couple that were in this study I just told you about, and they've advised us so far on our study recruitment materials, and we're gonna meet with them about every quarter. And then we interviewed some primary care providers about the decision aid. The decision aid has been through a lot of iterations, and we've run it by a lot of patient panels over the past two, three years that it's been under development. Um, so we had, we'd gotten lots of patient input already, but we hadn't gotten primary care provider input. So that was another aim in this first phase. And then our last aim in this first phase is the pilot clinical trial, which we're hoping to start recruiting um, really at the end of this month or beginning of June. And then after that, then we about this time next year, or maybe next fall, a year from fall, we will start the full, the fully powered clinical trial phase. So, um, yes, and I'd just like to give a nod to our, the co-investigators on the study team, as well as our project staff, um, none of whom, uh, without whom, none of this would have been possible for sure. So I appreciate their help, and I can take questions. We have a couple of questions about Dr. Eliason's presentation and chat. 
Maybe we'll. Right. Thank you, everybody. Well, I had one question for you, Marianne, and then we'll maybe move to the chat. So, um, could you describe a little bit more about the decision aid in terms of the mode of delivery? Is it, is it paper based? Can you do this virtually? H how long it is? And a little bit more about how it's administered. If I was following along, it sounds like it's a, a kind of a dialogue tool for the, the patient and their coach, but then also is used with the provider as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, David. It, we decided to go low tech and keep it paper, keep it simple. Um, although for now that you know we're doing a lot of recruitment, as many people are via email, so sometimes it's like an electronic um, word document. But either way, they they get two copies, and one is for them to hand to their primary care provider when they walk into their visit, um, and then the the other they'll fill out with their coach as they go along. So like the first uh, the first page, first section is what's important to you. And then, and there's a list of things as well as, a, you know, blanks for people to fill in what's important for them. And then the second page is, is I, I believe focused on things like I alluded to before where, you know, I prefer to work on pain on my own, or I prefer to work on pain in a group, that kind of thing, um, kind of on a sliding scale for their preferences. And then the next page is literally the list of different NPTs and those NPTs, we're doing a similar study at the VA and the VA because of a lot of initiatives they have going on, offer a whole lot more CIH modalities. Eskenazi, where we're doing this study is a little bit more limited, so we have fewer options, but there's always a spot or spots for people to add their own ideas because it's not intended to restrict people to, we're not dictating to them, oh, you can only do this, this, or this. Instead, we want people to think through what's important to them and what can they do. So for example, if somebody lives near a Y and can get to a pool, if that's something they wanna try rather than walking, which is on the decision aid, then they're welcome to try it. So um, we, we try to keep it flexible. And then there's a few more um, sections, including the end, really nailing down what you're gonna ask your doctor and then um, doing some role playing with the coach to practice talking to your doctor. And then we do ask them, we ask everybody to take a picture of their decision aid of all the pages on their phone in case they forget it because we know there's a good chance people will forget it. So yeah, that's kind of the basics. Yeah, all right. We do have a question for you in the chat. Okay. I'm, I'm over here. <laughs> um, it says, curious to know if the lack of communication between patient and doctor is more prevalent between black patient and black doctor or black patient and a doctor who is not black. Yeah, great question. There, there's a pretty good literature showing that racial concordance, so a black patient seeing a black doctor, um, there, there are, um, communication is better. The relationship is better and communication is better. Yeah. And we, you know, we, because this was a patient focused intervention, we haven't really tracked who the doctors are or any demographics, especially for this pilot study. I have a question, what's the outcome? The outcome for the, the funded trial, for the NIH funded trial, um, well, I mean, that's actually part of what we're exploring in this, see, I've never had a two-phase study before, it's really nice because you can kind of play around in the first phase and see what works. And then you, then you um, propose changes and then start the second phase. So um, I think pain interference is an outcome of interest as is depression, as is anxiety. But I think we may be really interested in things like patient activation, patient engagement, as, as well as shared decision making. You know, like some of the quotes that I read to you, you know, I felt heard. I felt like I took those appointments back because empowerment and self efficacy really is the first step before you can improve your clinical outcomes. You know, especially for something like pain which so much rides on self-management. So you have to make people feel like they can do it first, and then the, the pain outcomes come later. All right, thank you. Okay, let me go back up to the first question. 
Um, Dr. Patzer says great presentation on such an important topic. Can you talk a bit more about the current screening for social isolation and whether there's discussion around doing this beyond the emergency department and at other points of care? For Eskenazi Health, um, okay. Uh, so for the first phase of the study, um, the screening that we use was the SNI and um, it is actually one of the, I think, two recommended measures um, for health systems in general to use. So it's been validated and that uh, a lot of health systems are trying to screen for social determinants of health. And one of the ongoing debate is what measures should we use and how do we make it consistent so that we can compare across different sites and systems. So that is an ongoing debate. Um, so for Josh's study, he used the SNI, uh, which is kind of like the gold standard uh, in some places, uh, Eskenazi use a different measure. I think they just added some questions about how often do you interact with family members and, and friends, and uh, they use um, uh, overall score. Uh, I don't remember from the top of my head what's the name of the measure that they use. They are in the process of revising, and we've had discussions about which measure they should use to roll out in the new version of their screener. Uh, I don't know what they landed on. Um, so that that is to be seen to see which measure that, that they use. But this is a question that many healthcare systems are trying to figure out. Um, and I think they're rolling it in different clinics. It's kind of like a stepped uh, wise approach. Um, and they also, um, I think they just started with primary care. Um, if that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then Dr. Keith has a question. Um, please talk more about alternative terms to replace social isolation. This is the first time that I've heard that it is stigmatizing and am wondering what we should call it instead when recruiting participants. And that is a very good question, and I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm open to suggestions. I think uh, the, the feedback that we receive, and I've had a study on the VA side, again, focusing on social isolation, and I did not get that comment from veterans. They were fine with social isolation, but I think the spirit of it was to, of the comments, was to make it more uh, positive. Uh, we had feedback. There is also, I think, some age differences or older participants um, by older, I mean uh, individuals who are 65 and above, they really didn't like social isolation. Um, they thought it was more of a private concern. Um, they thought that it made, they, they were lonely and they don't have the skills to connect with other people. Younger uh, participants were um, more ambivalent about it, but I think they wanted something more positive like social connection and social interactions to kind of like frame it that way. I don't have um, a really good answer. It's like what to replace social isolation um, with, but I think in our push thinking about how we recruit participants, we'll have to um, focus more on how we can help them improve their social relationships and social connections and not talk about, are you isolated? Because it reflects badly. Thank you. All right, well, well, thank you very much. Thank you to our presenters for sharing the great work that they've accomplished. And we look forward to uh, learning along with you as you continue along these lines of research. So thanks, everyone.